here we are. We're about to move on to the next session. And um, obviously, um, you know, we've been talking about games today in this room. We've been talking about, uh, you know, the, the way that we evolve. We look at stats, the way we look at monetizing, a whole bunch of stuff. And obviously, the last uh, panel was talking about how people who are uh, coming from the gaming, gambling side of the industry and how they're learning about where we're going. Um, one of the areas we haven't covered yet and I think is an incredibly important part of where we're going as a maturing industry is looking at brands. And Eric Schwartz will hear from uh, De uh, Deck Dac is going to take us through that and help us understand what that means for us. Thank you very much. Eric. Cool. Great. Thanks for the intro. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for coming on by. Uh, my name is Eric Schwartzel, and I work with a bunch of different startups. Uh, one of the companies that I work with is uh, Deck Deck, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what Deck Deck does and why it's important uh, to kind of see some of the things that we've done with brands in the past and how it might be applicable to you as an independent uh, developer. <laughs> so three things we're going to cover today, uh, why brands are great for indies. Um, I'm going to show you some tools on how you can actually approach uh, brands uh, with your game. And then also a successful example of some of the stuff that I did with uh, Real Madrid. So um, I'm going to go through a kind of a quick flashback. Uh, the last time I was actually at Casual Connect, I did a speech uh, about core publishers in a casual world. Uh, I was working for Vivendi Games at the time, and I was doing digital distribution. And it was way back in July of 2007, so I've been kind of doing this for a while. Uh, but what's really interesting is the way that the uh, industry has really transitioned. Uh, at that time, I was on a panel with IDOS, Activision, and then myself over at Vivendi Games. And since then, the whole industry has really just transformed upside down. Uh, Zynga was actually formed in that month. Uh, and even though with all the bad press and everything, they still have 39 million uh, daily active users and about 187, 187 um, million uh, monthly average users. Uh, the iPhone was launched uh, that year in December. Uh, and since then, they're now also at 1 billion Facebook users. Uh, and then also what's really important, I think, for independent developers, and I'm going to focus on this, uh, the use of Facebook Connect, um, where you have the ability to see what's in the social and what's in the interest graph. Uh, the social graph is you and all your friends, and then the interest graph is uh, what everybody likes and what's common in between everybody uh, for a specific brand, and that's called affinities. And it's very important when you work with brands uh, to focus on this thing called affinities. Uh, but now I think we're in another transition, and that's why I'm really excited about this space for in indies. Um, at the end of this year, we're going to have the PS4, uh, we're going to have the Xbox One, and then we're also going to have the iPhone 5S. Uh, and then also what just happened last week was the merger between Publicis and Omnicom. Um, the reason why, I, in my opinion, why this happened is they're having a, a tough time battling uh, the larger digital portals, specifically like Google. And I think this, again, is a, um, a great opportunity for independent game developers to work with brands. Um, so the overall theme that's kind of happened in the last, say, six years is uh, brands are going direct, which is, again, a great opportunity for indies. And uh, they, want to know, they want to learn more about their consumer. At the end of the day, everybody thinks that uh, it's their consumer. OK. So how do indies thrive? Uh, imagine most of the people here are independent game developers. Uh, you need lots of traffic. Ideally, it's unique traffic. Uh, your games need to be easily discoverable. Uh, and you also need passionate fans that are playing your games uh, that are willing to spend money. Um, a very difficult proposition considering all the different apps that are out there today. So brands, uh, I think of these guys as the new publishers. Uh, the reason why is because they have lots of unique traffic. Uh, they're very easily discoverable. And you, they also have a lot of passionate fans that are willing to spend money. OK, so let's get down to the consumer brands and the different types of brands and how your games might be applicable to all these different types of brands. Uh, I call them SERPs. Uh, we have service brands, which are like United Airlines and Hertz. They don't actually uh, give you anything, but it's more of like a service, kind of like a rental or like a flight. Uh, we also have entertainment brands. And these are the ones that are probably the most obvious choices, but they're also potentially the hardest choices, too. So entertainment brands are like the NBA uh, or the upcoming World Cup um, or Major League Baseball uh, or Paramount Studios or any of the movie houses. Uh, and then we also have retail brands. Uh, and these are the brick and mortar kind of guys, typically. Uh, they can also be uh, e-commerce. Um, but retail brands are great partners, uh, like Home Depot or Walgreens. Uh, and then you have product brands. Uh, these are the Pepsis, the Sonys, and the Fords. 
So which brands work? Um, there are three things that I typically look at when I look for a brand partner. Uh, I look for brands where the consumers are actually involved with the product. And typically, uh, there's some sort of time investment. Uh, what I mean by that is uh, glad trash bags. And I guess we're being filmed, so hopefully they're not going to get mad at me. <laughs> but, <laughs> but they're not really a very good brand that you want to work with. Potentially, they could be if you get very creative and you have some sort of toss game. Uh, but initially, my first instinct is, you know what, it's not a very good, uh, it's not a good brand to work with. Uh, because the consumer doesn't spend much time with it. They spend a lot of time with it, but not much time with it. What I mean by that is they take out the trash every day, they do it every day, but they don't like doing it, and they only do it for a certain amount of time. So try to look for something where there's like a time investment. Um, then there's also product exclusivity, some sort of emotional connection. And what I mean by that is look at the brands that you're wearing today. Uh, I noticed a purse when we walked in. That, that could be a great product. People. Um, that are uh, proud of the brand that they're carrying around. These could be also good products uh, for your, brand, uh, your game to be involved with. And then last but not least, uh, the brand, the total market size. And it can be broken down into uh, more of the accessible fan base. And what I mean by that is, all you have to do is go onto Facebook, look at how many likes they have. If they have over a million likes, then it could be a very good partner. If they have under a million likes, I'd run. I wouldn't work with them at all. And I'll explain why uh, the Facebook number is also important. Okay, so um, my whole talk is talking about how brands are great partners, but there's a big caveat here. There's uh, lots of reasons why you, why you don't want to work with brands. Uh, the first one is, well, they're definitely a pain in the ass to work with. <laughs> um, everything takes twice as long. Um, but at the end of the day, it's also like ice cream on a hot day is kind of the example I gave uh, when I went to an ad agency. Um, once you're kind of hooked on working with brands, it's kind of hard to kind of get off it. Um, because it's really, really easy once you kind of get into the flow and you start doing these things. Uh, the other problem is it's not your character IP, so you become almost a technology or a platform provider, which could be a problem depending on what kind of uh, developer you are. And then the last part is potentially you share in the revenue, depending on how you set up the deal. Um, sometimes it could be a, a deal where they pay you in advance, uh, and then your game is free, or other times you do a rev share on, like, um, uh, on the virtual goods or something like that. Okay, so uh, I promised you guys some cool tools uh, to look at. Um, the first one is uh, what I suggest you do is check out the largest Facebook fan pages. Um, there's some pretty obvious ones. Uh, there's Facebook, obviously, number one. Uh, Rihanna, four. Coca-Cola, six. Uh, Ronaldo, number 12. And there's a reason why I put him up there. And then uh, Real Madrid at number 46. And that's who I'm going to actually uh, explore a little bit more about the project that I've done with Real Madrid. Uh, and the reason why I put Dallas Cowboys is uh, I want to kind of put Real Madrid in perspective with the Dallas Cowboys because a lot of people here aren't familiar with Real Madrid as a football or soccer club over in Europe. Uh, but they are, hopefully everybody in the room is familiar with Dallas Cowboys. So Real Madrid has approximately 40 million Facebook fans. Uh, Dallas Cowboys has, uh, well, under 6 million. So just to put things in perspective, there are a lot of pages out there on, uh, in the Facebook world um, that you might not be familiar with, but they have a lot of Facebook fans. So you should definitely take advantage of that. Okay, so Real Madrid. Um, I guess the stat that I'm always impresses me is uh, they have one of the highest number of shirt sales a season uh, at the arena. They sell about $1.5 million worth of t-shirt sales. So when I heard that stat, I was like, wow, I, uh, I definitely got to approach these guys and I think I can sell some pretty cool games with them. So anyways, I got lucky and um, I uh, ended up uh, doing a game with them. So what they want to do is they want to bridge the physical world with the digital world. And that's going to be something that you're going to hear reoccurring through most of the brands. Uh, especially like the retail brands that have a brick and mortar store like say a Walmart or like um, a Home Depot or uh, Walgreens. They always want to get people into the stores. So the same thing with Real Madrid. What they want to do is they want to get fans uh, passionate about uh, their games and follow them on television or go in the stadium or buy the the clothing. So what we decided to do was uh, come up with a, a digital trading card platform. And the trading card platform allows you to collect all the players. And then when you collect all the players, you get prizes and rewards. Uh, we also built that as a platform because we figured it's easily uh, transportable to other types of brands. Um, oh yeah, one stat. So uh, we launched the app on uh, May the 1st. I guess actually was a soft launch. The official launch I think was more like around June. And uh, so when I show you the stats, uh, hopefully you'll be impressed. 
Okay, so this is the game on Facebook. Uh, we suggest that you launch on Facebook first, just because it's a very easy pitch when you go to these brands and you say, hey, listen, you have, in case of Real Madrid, you have 38 million Facebook fans. Uh, what are you doing to monetize those fans? And you know, the obvious answer is they're like, uh, nothing. <laughs> so you say, listen, I want to make you a game. Uh, we're going to monetize those fans, and we're going to share in the revenue, and we can cross-promote all your other products. So we can cross-promote t-shirts, ticket sales, all sorts of things. And usually, you know, at the end of the meeting, they're like, yeah, that sounds great. When do we start? So that's what we did. Uh, this is the app. Um, this is the game itself. So your game, uh, what your goal is to collect all these uh, trading cards. And then when you collect all the cards, you get prizes and rewards after you complete the whole thing. Uh, the cards all have a front, and then they also have a back. What's really interesting here, or what, or what kind of things that we kind of plugged in to help uh, increase the viral aspect of the game is, uh, we put a like button on all the individual cards, uh, a pin it button, a Google Plus, and a tweet. Um, so this one, for example, he's not uh, not that familiar with all the team guys, <laughs> but I don't think he's like a major player over there. But we already have 362 likes just on this one uh, card. And then when people like it, it then goes into the news feed, uh, and then additional friends also come to play the game. Uh, the back of the card has um, real-time updates, so when somebody scores, uh, the actual card then gets update, updated with additional information. And then we also have a mobile component, uh, and that's launching in September. Okay, so I'm going to give you another tool that's kind of, uh, that I think is pretty cool. Uh, it's called uh, Fact, Fact Hits or something like that. Uh, basically, what it will do is it will tell you uh, the Mao and the Dao of any products that are out there. So, for instance, it's very good from a competitive analysis standpoint. Um, so, naturally, I put in uh, our product. Um, so, this is the Real Madrid game. We have about 357,000 monthly active users. Um, our daily active users is uh, it's actually higher than that. It's about 30,000 or so. Um, so, what's cool about this is, like I said, we launched this, um, say, May. Uh, and in less than two months, or a little bit over two months or so, we have already 357,000 downloads. Um, no advertising, all organic. Um, and this is the kind of stuff that you guys should be doing with uh, your products. Okay, so here's some other stats. Um, the albums, we sold over uh, 250,000 albums. Uh, individual packs, 1.8 million. Uh, cards placed in the albums, 5.4 million. Uh, cards sold on the marketplace, so we have kind of like an eBay type mechanism in there. Uh, over 180,000 cards have been sold on the marketplace. And then we also have like a mini game area. And the mini game area um, is kind of like slot machines and that kind of thing. Uh, over 2 million uh, mini games played. And then we also created a separate Facebook page just for the game. And we have over uh, 40,000 likes just on that part. Um, <clears throat> so now I'm going to talk about the affinities. And this is the stuff that you should get to know when you go into the brand, so you can find out what's similar between all the likes of a brand, um, so that you can then either pitch uh, your product and say, you know, um, our fans also like Nike or Adidas football, Armani. So what you're trying to do is create this uh, synergy between your game and then whoever brand you're pitching. Um, we're using a, uh, a tool, I can't give you the name of it because uh, it's still kind of in beta, but um, if you guys send me an email, I think they said they're going to go out of beta at the end of August, and I'll show you the tool that we used. Uh, but the tool that we use, uh, these are all the people that like our game that also like um, uh, the Real Madrid game. And as you can see, these are all potential advertisers for Real Madrid, and these are all things, uh, companies that potentially can also advertise within the stadium. Um, so when I give this uh, I guess when I talk to different ad agencies, uh, I like to also do a brand audience comparison so they understand kind of where their brand that, they're, that I'm talking with, how it fits in, I guess, into the Facebook uh, ecosystem. So this is a comparison between New Balance and Nike in the United States. Um, uh, the tool that I was using allows us to find out where all the fans are from. Uh, and the ones that are bold, it shows kind of like a distinct difference when we do a comparison. So for New Balance, uh, if I was doing either a print ad, say I'm doing like a magazine ad or like a newspaper ad, I would be targeting uh, Boston, Austin, and Atlanta. If I was uh, Nike, I guess I didn't do it for Nike. Um, so, and for New Balance, uh, another thing that popped up was this thing called the Tough Mudder. Uh, also, the fans that like New Balance also like Best Buy, Southwest, 
uh, Dunkin' Donuts, and these are all the affinities. Uh, but what's cool is also media shows up there too, like Runner's World, Women's Health, and these are all things that didn't show up on also on the uh, Nike likes. And uh, to show that this stuff really works, um, there was a great article in the New York Times uh, right after I kind of uh, did that, uh, uh, that uh, I guess, the affinity test. And they were talking about how uh, New Balance is now using the Tough Mudder <laughs> and uh, how they're trying to do some different targeting in different cities. It's a great article if you want to see how um, social media uh, works with large brands. I think it was in the July 8th issue or July 8th. Um, uh, newspaper. Okay, so what do brands want? Um, they want fan engagement, they want brand name recognition, they also want to learn uh, the data on them, and you can get this data from Facebook. Uh, they also want to do a fan segmentation, and what I mean by that is they want to separate the people that are actually buying stuff um, with the people that are buying even more stuff, so the frequent purchasers. Um, they also want to be considered innovative, and that's like another thing that you should pitch with when you talk to these brands with your game. Um, and then ultimately, they want it, you know, an ROI, some sort of R&I. So you can put in either couponing or links within your game into uh, purchasing from like an e-commerce or maybe even like a store locator. So these are the partners um, that I'm currently working with. Um, the platform definitely works, uh, and hopefully your game is also uh, transportable enough so that you can work with multiple brands. Uh, but recently signed deals with uh, Garfield, AC Milan, Muhammad Ali. Uh, Dilbert, uh, Dogs and Friends, Fraggle Rock, uh, AS Roma, and then also Elvis. <laughs> uh, the Dog and Friends one's kind of cool because we're also working with a dog food company on that one. So, which is kind of cool because um, it shows you the uh, just the ability to take something and uh, target the target audience that the dog food company wants, which is obviously dog owners. And uh, that's the end of my presentation. Um, any questions? Yeah, sure. So, uh, when you first approach the brand company, mm -hmm. I mean, what's the, what's, what's the, uh, how do you pitch yourself to them? Yeah, how do you so, gain their trust? Yeah, uh, so this right here, just copy this. So they all, they all have these Facebook pages with literally millions of pa uh, fans on there. They've probably made a very large investment to get those fans. They've acquired those fans. They don't have the internal expertise to actually engage those fans. So the first thing I focus on is uh, you know, fan engagement. Uh, the second thing is I then come up with the data so that shows that your game is relevant for their audience. Um, and then try to t uh, build in some sort of ROI so that they can either do couponing or store locator or it depends on you know, what kind of brand it is. If you look at... Um, this slide here. So depending on what kind of brand it is, whether it's a service brand, entertainment, retail, or product brand, uh, each one you have to kind of target a little bit differently. But at the end of the day, I always go back to these bullet points here. Right there. So I, I actually find this fascinating because um, I talk a lot about brands and games in the UK. There's a lot of companies that have been quite successful, but typically what happens is that they work with a uh, a big brand. The brand has some R&D budget. They use the R&D budget up for a project, which is a game, and then there's no follow-up. Mm -hmm. It sounds like you may have sort of cracked it. I mean, is my experience just saying that the UK is behind the rest of the world? or? Um. Yeah, I don't know if they're ahead or behind, but what I would say is um, brands in the United States are very receptive to this, but it's, I don't have just U.S. brands. Um, no, I, I also have, you know, like Real Madrid and so forth, AC Milan, um, the, the amount of fans that they have dwarf the stuff that's happening over here for sports brands. So, um, yeah, it's a case by case It strikes me that what I think is different from my perspective is that you're focusing on how do they can leverage their other assets. Whereas typical yeah. games for brands seem, from my perspective, to be focused on simply a promotional exercise for that brand itself. Right. Do you think that might be? Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, um, for instance, Real Madrid, we're selling shirts, tickets, um, experiences. Uh, when they complete the card deck, uh, we know that they're a very passionate fan. So then we give them prizes, like signed calendars and that kind of thing. So we try to, there's always hooks in there to kind of consider them to come back. And then the great thing about Real Madrid is every year they have new players. 
So we did like a Hall of Fame one deck, and then we now did the 2012, 2013, and now we're working on the next uh, deck for next year. Any more questions? So regarding brands where you kind of draw the characters like Dilbert and Garfield, right? I, I guess that they, they probably give you a brand Bible and your artists will need to adhere yeah. by those. How, how hard is it is f for your artists to pick up you know, another professional yeah. style like that? So um, I'm lucky because uh, our game is essentially a 2D game. Uh, and that's what we, uh, it's what kind of what I would encourage initially to kind of because if you start doing a 3D game and it's a brand, then there's so many other like sign-offs and so forth. So if you keep it simple, uh, like ours is, they actually gave us all these assets, so they're just normal pictures, and then uh, we just crop them so that it fits into our templates. So uh, it takes us probably about two to three weeks to actually make a game using the assets. Um, and we also, um, the cards, since there are only 48 cards in each deck, you know, they just have to provide us with 48 pictures. Uh, but, you, I mean, you're right, it's just to address your uh, Garfield and Dilbert one, uh, when you're working with somebody that's uh, a specialist in animation, uh, they're definitely a little bit more uh, critical and they'll give you a lot more constructive feedback on your... Uh... But I'll give a great story on Dilbert, just because um, this stuff actually really does happen. So uh, I was doing a project with a company called Corona Labs. They have a, um, a 2D gaming engine. And uh, what we did was a contest to use the, uh, the Dilbert assets to come up with a Corona Labs game for iPhone. Um, and we got a bunch of submissions. Uh, the, the guy that actually won was a guy that uh, his app sold about 7,000 of them. Um, it's been out for a couple months. And it was kind of a line runner game. So basically, you know, you draw your finger and then the character will kind of follow it. So what he did was he swapped out his character with Wally, which is one of the Dilbert characters. Um, and then instead of like these little balloons I think he had before, he put coffee beans. And then the goal was for the, uh, the character Wally to actually escape his cubicle. And Scott Adams, who, who's the creator of Dilbert, he loved it. And he thought this was awesome. So it's actually going to become a real game. And it's kind of like a dream come true for this independent game developer. He worked, uh, it's his first game, uh, first one only sold 7,000 units. And now he's got a Dilbert game. So, um, you know, perseverance definitely uh, pays off. Uh, do you recommend that people go directly to the brands or try to uh, get to the ad agencies uh, that represent piles of don't brands? Don't say the A word. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've done some stuff with the agency and the problem is uh, it's just an extra set of hands. Uh, and then they take all the credit. <laughs> So uh, yeah, if possible, I would go directly to the brand. And the brands are getting big enough now that, um, I mean, that's the reason why um, uh, Publicis and Omnicom actually have merged, is because these brands are now going direct to the consumers and these agencies are, basically agencies are just middlemen. And Yeah, I, I'd back that up as well from the companies I know in the UK are doing this kind of thing. Uh, the agencies are just a barrier to any progress. Uh, and it's, um, you know, it's the media brands directly or all the, all the yeah. To be honest, I think the guys that I've seen are mostly finding those willing to be innovative. So the Red Bulls, the Audis, who are really willing to try something different. They're the ones that seem to be most open-minded. But if there are any agencies in here, I'll work with you. <laughs> <laughs> they won't be here. Cool. Any more questions? Well, on that note, I'm going to thank Eric very much for joining us. And that was a great talk. <laughs> <laughs>